Yeah, so some people in the audience have not been to an academic conference before. Some people are pretending they haven't been to one before. Um, but if it is your first conference, I just want to let you know a few things about the way this, this kind of thing typically works. Um, number one, we usually save questions or comments until the end. And so all three people will have 15 to 20 minutes to share their wonderful work with you. And if you develop questions as they are presenting, what you can do is use one of our handy dandy and free notepads and pens over here. So I do recommend you grab a notepad and some pen, uh, a pen, uh, so that you can jot down any thoughts you have as someone is presenting. And at the end of all of the presentations, you'll be able to ask a question or make a comment. And quite often, as has been the case all day, sometimes you'll want to ask a question of all three panelists um, and have them all respond. And so just let the panelists know at the end, you know, who the question is directed to, whom the question is directed, uh, and if it's all of them. Um, something else to say is we do have a few journals. Please only take one if you will use it. If you will use it, please do take one. But we have limited supplies because the journal was so thick this year. There were just too many people doing too many smart things. And, and so um, we only printed about half as many as usual. It is also available online if that uh, helps you make your decision as to whether you want to grab one or not. We have some flyers over here for the upcoming sessions for tomorrow and the next day. And we have some bookmarks that can clarify for you how to submit. Um, and so those of you who are students here at Red Rocks should keep in mind that you know every year we publish this journal and if you ever do anything that you're really proud of in one of your classes tell your instructor to submit it. Um, it does need to be instructor, sub instructor sponsored submission unless you're a member of PTK in which case you're allowed to directly submit. Um, and so I hope to see submissions from all of you in the audience next year and I hope to see some of your faces up on the stage next year. So the theme of today of the last panel of the day is the scope of art. We're about to become thoroughly enlightened about uh, all the uses of art and art analysis and the uses of art as far as inspiring um, and transforming lives. I'm really excited. This is sort of, I shouldn't say this, but one of my favorite favorite panels I've been looking forward to. I just really, really love art analysis and I make my students do it all the time. So um, I geek out to this stuff pretty hard. Um, we're gonna um, have the panelists introduce themselves to you, um, but I will just give a brief overview of what's happening. Um, our first speaker, Michaela, is going to to share with you a comic that she created as a response to I don't know, the, the princess syndrome. Is that sort of how we ter you termed it, yeah. right? And then Sydney here is going to be uh, talking through this creative process um, behind a mural that she created, which is a really fantastic mural. We're gonna get to see it, right? Wonderful. Um, and then Lauren is going to um, help us take a closer look at a piece of art many of you walk by probably every day here at Red Rocks and might not have taken the time to look at very closely, which is it's called the Knowledge Network over at the main entrance, the Da Vinci sort of reproduction above the info desk. And so that's what's in store for you today. Um, we will be uh, starting with Michaela, and I will hand over the mic. Hi. Am I just going now? Okay, cool. That is not fairy tale. I'm thinking of a fairy tale, cinder elephant, sleeping tubby, snow weight, where the princess is not anorexic, wasp wasted, flinging herself down the stairs. I'm thinking of a fairy tale, Hansel and Great, Rapunzel, <laughs> Bounty and the Beast, where the beauty has a pillowed breast and fingers as plump as sausages. I am thinking of a fairy tale that is not yet written, for a teller not yet born, for a listener not yet conceived, for a world not yet won. Where everything round is good, the sun, wheels, cookies, and the princess. That was a poem by Jane Yolen, and it was the first poem that made me realize there was, in fact, a princess standard. That there was a required level of beauty that a princess needed to have in order to actually be considered one of our fairy tale princesses. 
These are some of our typical Disney fairy tale princesses. They have tiny waist, perfect hair. No real noticeable flaws or things that detract from who they are. It is no wonder that as we look at these people, if we're a little bit more round, or if we're not nearly as curvy, that we do tend to develop a sort of complex about who we are. And we feel that we aren't princess material. Why can't someone like her be princess material? Why can't someone with scars or piercings, unevenly cut hair, who's a little bit of a rebel, who is flawed, who is human, why can't someone like this be a fairy tale princess? Why is it that the princess standard leaves out so many young women? Why is it that we define a princess by their beauty? And what happens to those who aren't princess beauty? How are they portrayed in these fairy tales? The skinny, tall people. The people who are a little bit larger, but still confident in who they are. Oop. The people who dress a little bit more conserved. They aren't necessarily going to show everything about themselves. Or the people who are even aging, women who aren't aging beautifully, who aren't aging the way society deems beautiful. These women become our villains of our tales. These are the people that become jealous of our princesses. They envy their youth, their beauty, their kindness, their very life. These villains are women that we are. And sometimes the positive ending is that instead of being a villain, we're cast as the help. The rounder, prince, or the rounder women are our fairy godmothers, women who aren't aesthetically appealing, are there to help our princesses get their prince. These women could be our mothers, and yet they don't even talk about how these women's tales end. They are just a minor character put there to help our princess. So it is no wonder that as we progress through it, oh, skipped a part, sorry. We do have some exceptions to this whole princess standard. We have Anna from Frozen, who doesn't have that perfect hair with her streak of gray, and she does have some freckles. We have Fiona from Shrek, who is an ogre. That is definitely not princess material. And then we have Merida, who does have a rounder face. And Merida is one of the only princesses we have who doesn't, at the end of her tale, end up marrying a prince. But with these few exceptions, how are they supposed to make a difference in a sea of perfect princesses? With how perfect we are expected to be, women begin to doubt who they are. They fall towards eating disorders because they're too fat. They slouch because they're too tall. They don't accept themselves for who they are and begin to hate themselves because they're not the atypical princess beauty. Which is why they end up rooting for the villain. Our villains are strong enough to conquer on their own. They are strong, powerful women that more often than not we come to respect, even if they don't go about achieving their goals in the most perfect manner. However, because they are the villain, they don't get true love's kiss. They don't get someone that they're partnered up with. They don't get that happily ever after that princesses do receive. 
more often than not, <laughs> our villains are killed at the end of their story. Whether it is the prince slaying him, some tragic misfortunate event, our villains are always dead at the end of the tale. Because this villain is in the way of the princess's happiness. And because the villain is there, it is almost like the happiness isn't guaranteed. And if the villain were to live through the tale, we wouldn't be certain that they wouldn't come back and attack our princess. So the villain has to suffer. The villain has to die. However, there are some who start out as what we think are villains, but come to learn through their tale that they're actually not that bad. Elsa from Frozen and Maleficent from Maleficent are some of these people who are actually saved by the princess, which is why they're allowed to live. They have changed. They're no longer scared and powerful enough to wipe out the princess and ruin their happiness. However, with that confidence, our powerful women are turned into sex icons that during their most powerful moments we see not really as a flawed human who has changed and grown, but as a sexy woman who has found confidence. And it is because of this confidence that they have, they end up alone because what man could match up to someone who is just so self-assured that they don't even need someone to be like, oh, don't worry, you'll be okay. These women are fine with who they are. And because of that, they're going to end up without that perfect happily ever after. And instead, they're going to act as guides for the princess so they may achieve their happily ever after. For some reason, sex appeal is always tied to our villains, or our villains mention it. In The Little Mermaid, Ariel, er, yeah, Ariel is talking to Ursula, and Ursula mentions how it doesn't matter about Ariel's voice, because the most important thing is her body language. She is told that silence is more important than being able to speak who you are. Our princesses are taught that in order to get a prince, they need to remain silent. They are not to speak, they are only to use their bodies to talk. This makes us believe that putting out is the only way to get a prince. That if we're quiet and we're good enough, maybe we'll get a prince. If we work hard enough, if we're beautiful enough, maybe we will get that prince. Our princesses are also always needing a helping hand. Whether, as in Rapunzel, it's the need to get out of the tower. She could have done it all along. She had the dreams, the hopes, to see the glowing lanterns herself. But she doesn't actually leave the tower until her prince comes to the tower and they leave together. Then we have Tiana from The Princess and the Frog. The entire story is about how hard she works for her restaurant, how many jobs she works to save money to buy it. And they agreed on a deal because they didn't think she'd actually make it, and in the end they deny her it. She uses one of her friends to make them accept the original terms. Because in a world where women aren't considered as strong as men, sometimes you have to have a male voice to fight against the sexism that they bring about. And finally, the most cliche rescue, true love's kiss. We have our two ladies on the left who are Snow White and Sleeping Beauty, who need the kiss to be awoken from their death-like slumber. And then we have Fiona and Shrek, who use it to break the curse so Fiona isn't constantly switching between the beautiful princess and the ugly ogre. One thing that this does is by providing the princess with the true love's kiss, it differentiates what our villain doesn't have. You never see a villain who receives true love's kiss 
except for in Maleficent, and that's only one of our newer ones. Our villain is constantly unable to love and feel. Our powerful women are constantly cut off from this feeling of love. And because of this, we are expected as women to sit on the sidelines, watch men save us, in order to receive that true love that we so desperately desire. And the villains are left on their own to contemplate what they ha could have done wrong. They are left without anyone to help them. Our powerful women cannot ask for help because it per is perceived as weak. But sometimes even the strongest of people need a helping hand. So what we need to do in order to change this is write a fairy tale in which our princess isn't perfect. She isn't always kind. She is someone who is a bit more human. We need someone who is a lot like us. So that way our generation will not have to struggle with the body images that are forced upon us so that we don't have to fight to become the heroine of our own tale that we can be strong and confident and not have to go through a journey of self-discovery in order to realize we're actually perfect the way we are. What we really need in order to receive that happy end for everyone is not just a fatter princess. We need the flat as a board princess, the one who is tall and awkwardly looms over her prince princess. We need all the types of women who are casted as villains and sidekicks to become princesses of tales. We need princesses who are strong enough to not ask, to ask for help, but also strong enough to get through the tale on their own. What we need is a different happily ever after in order for everyone to receive it. <laughs> All right, well, my name is Sydney Holder. Um, I think this is a really awesome opportunity, so I just wanted to thank you for letting me be a part of it. Um, so I actually just recently found out that a video I had made last spring was accepted into Claro. Um, but I did make the decision not to actually show the video. Um, there's two reasons. One, I would just prefer to talk about it. Um, and then second, um, a lot of time has passed since I made it. Um, so I've learned a little bit more about the topic. Um, so today I'll be talking about two separate assignments that I've made and just how they're connected. <clears throat> so the video I made was one of the final projects in my English 121 class with Sarah Fall. Um, I remember pretty much every assignment we did in that class um, because they all required me to be really thoughtful and reflective. Um, <clears throat> the main guideline for the project was to create a video that just provided insight on an alternative form of literacy. Um, so I'm a painter and an artist, so I instantly knew that I wanted to talk about my own passion, which is visual and creative literacy. Um, when I talk about creative expression and what it means to me, I usually wonder if I'm even making sense to anyone else. Um, so because of this, I'm just going to touch on the surface, um, try not to get it too complicated. Um, so first, I'm just going to spend some time recreating that three and a half minute video I made, um, but also add a little bit and talk about why I made some of the choices I made. Um, and then next, I'm just going to talk about my own personal experience and how I use creative literacy in my own life. Um, and then finally, I just want to talk about a second project that I did um, last semester in English 122. Um, and all I'm going to say is that it was one of my favorite assignments so far at Red Rocks. So. Um, I'm not an expert on the topic at all from like a research standpoint, um, but I just have a lot of experience with it, so I figured that was enough to share with you guys. So, um, 
basically I'm just an advocate of creative expression because um, it's the most influential thing in my life. So as far back as I can remember, I was taught that art and visual expression is equally important and useful as the written word. Um, yeah, I mean, art can be beautiful and moving and inspiring just because of the way it looks, um, but in my head, it was always a way to express a thought, um, especially in a way that had never been done before. So every detail can hold a specific meaning or purpose. As a kid, I also loved to read, um, but I was especially fascinated by illustrations and just the way that it could tell the story and also enhance it in most cases. Um, so, I don't know, I mean, even before a child can read or talk, they can understand what's going on based on what they see. Um, I'm lucky I've had a mom and a grandma who are both artists, so they always encouraged me um, to just experiment and be creative and do whatever I wanted to do. Uh, so I can't remember exactly what it was that sparked this idea, but as a freshman in high school, I decided I wanted to try painting a mural in my bedroom. So I asked my mom for permission. She smiled at me and asked me if I needed any supplies and then just told me not to get paint on the carpet. <laughs> so kind of free reign there, which is what I needed. So my intention was just really simple. <clears throat> I unique. Um, so I just painted everything that I love. Um, so every time I walked in the door, I felt a sense of peace despite what was happening around me. Um, and after that, I just fell in love with painting murals. I don't do like outdoor ones on the sides of buildings or anything. I just like to do them in people's personal and private spaces. Um, I discovered that I had the ability to change the way a space feels and with success, the emotions of the people in the room. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, as a 15 year old, I drank a lot of Starbucks. Um, I played a lot of golf. And that cactus right there is actually the album art for an 11 song rap CD I made that same day. Yeah, I, I got my hands in all kinds of stuff. So. <laughs> uh, after I graduated high school in 2009, um, a family friend of ours had seen my bedroom and asked me to paint a mural in her brand new clinic. Um, she's a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, so her patients are all kids with broken bones and growth abnormalities and things like that. So the idea behind the mural was to inspire the patients um, to just keep having fun despite what they're going through um, and to just make the clinic a more happy and positive place because that's not really where kids want to go. So um, a lot of thought had been put into the theme of this new clinic and so the staff came up with a slogan um, which was the road to get up and go. Uh, <clears throat> so the main hallway through the clinic was carpeted to look like a road. So there was like the yellow lines running up it and it was black carpet. Um, and they also installed a working stoplight at the end so the kids could like change the light color and everything. And that was where the doctors w watched them walk to see like if what was going on with them. So um, <clears throat> I was asked to paint the walls on both sides of the hallway um, and then as well as the end behind the stoplight, which is a total of about 500 square feet. Um, I chose to use this mural in that video I made because it's just a really great example of another way to convey a message. So I had the general idea of what they wanted and I knew that my intent was to in inspire and appeal to as many people as possible that came through there. Um, and other than that, I didn't do a sketch or anything. I just decided what I was going to do next each morning when I went in. Um, I just think this allowed me to be inspired by what was actually happening right then and there. Um, <clears throat> so before I even picked up the paintbrush, the creative outlet was already benefiting me. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life at that point in time. <clears throat> uh, I was engaging in some destructive hobbies also. Um, <laughs> So without that opportunity, I could have easily just become so much more lost um, just without that creative purpose. Um, so now I'll just explain a little bit about how I attempt attempted to achieve these goals with the mural. <clears throat> so because there was an actual phrase um, and title of the project, I just decided to sneak the words in there in a few different places. So some examples here. <clears throat>
And then the next strategy I used was to include as many just activities and sources of fun that I could think of. Um, as an artist, I just really understand that every kid finds joy in their own special way. So I just wanted to use as many different and their families could find something to relate to. Um, the first thing I thought of was sports. Um, I wanted to know that the patients, you know, could still be a part of these physical activities despite their additional obstacles. Um, and then it would just remind the kids that they could look forward to participating in these activities if they just stayed positive in their recovery. <clears throat> So the next I just included um, basically anything else I could think of. Um, just things that bring joy and <clears throat> wonder. So fire trucks, kids like fire trucks. Um, and then after that, I just picked some things that inspired me just about the world that we live in. So. Um, finally, there's a personal message that I always incorporate in every piece of art that I make. Um, and I'm a Denver native, and I'm super proud of it and grateful. I mean, of all the places I was born was the place that I would have choose to be born. So um, I just think it's really important to find beauty and inspiration in your surroundings. Um, I learned really quickly when I was younger that changing my location and my environment rather than my thinking was not going to fix any of my problems. Um, so the way I conveyed this message was just to paint some of my, thing, or my favorite things about Colorado. Um, I did some aspen trees and the skyline there, um, mountains. So um, <clears throat> When the mural was finished, I was extremely happy with what I did. And more importantly, I took a step back and watched something that really did make people smile. I just thought that just positive things that people can do and Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, and then here's just kind of an idea. There's the stop light down at the end there in the carpet. Um, so I put some road signs. Um, yeah, 500 square feet, so there's a lot of stuff in there. <clears throat> um, so as a kid, I just knew. I just knew that creative and visual literacy was gonna be the way that I did things. Um, I just didn't know why, really. Um, so now, as an adult, I've discovered that creative expression is not only the closest thing that I have to a religion, but is the means by which and the reason that I'm even here. So, um, as an adult, I was also diagnosed with bipolar disorder, um, and that was a pretty difficult time just trying to figure out what was going on, why I felt the way I did. Um, <clears throat> So once I was aware of the way that my brain worked, I was just able to begin like engineering a way to use creativity to come through for me, um, which was a creative act in itself. So um, the first re kind of realization I made was that having the actual diagnosis um, and explanation for the way I was feeling instantly solved half of my problems. The more I understood what the problem was, the more I was able to find a way to cope with it. Um, I, do, I, do, I do use medication too. I mean, I really, really support like creativity as a treatment, but um, the reason I even say that is just because being creative is doing everything that you possibly can to try to help yourself. So um, the real progress though is to be ma made by changing my outlook um, and just the way I think and behave. So <clears throat> with the diagnosis, I was finally just able to see what my creativity was capable of. 
Um, so knowing I had found a way already to get through it all, it just gave me the confidence to keep going and uh, figure out what I was going to do. So um, since then, I've just become really fascinated by the psychology of mental health um, and how creative outlet can allow a person to take negative thoughts and emotions and turn them into positive and productive results that they didn't even think they were capable of. So. Um, not only do I want to use this in my own life, um, but just to show others that they have options and the power to create what they want and what they need. Um, so during the last fall semester, um, all of this was the topic of a major research paper that I wrote um, in English 122. So I attempted to investigate the way that creativity could allow for optimal coping strategies, basically, um, from a scientific perspective, but also through my own experience. <clears throat> so by writing the paper, I also reinforced that mental health and creativity are still two of the most complex mysteries. Like, you just really can't explain either one. Um, so, and creativity has a different meaning to everyone, too. So the connections that are made are just endless. Um, some people prefer writing or music or dance or building or engineering, cooking, whatever. Um, but I personally love visual art because it just gives me an opportunity to express what I want to say, <clears throat> what I can't say with words, and in a way that other people maybe could understand what I'm trying to say. So. Um, the words that I would need, they just don't exist because nobody else has experienced them before but me. And then the second part of the writing assignment was to express the same thesis and ideas um, just using any additional genre of your choice. Um, so, you know, some people wrote songs and plays and brochures, blogs, whatever. So. I just immediately chose to create a painting because that's what I do, um, which I actually flew my canvas and all my paints to Oklahoma to finish over Thanksgiving break, so that was fun. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that with you also just because it's another example um, of how a direct message can be embodied through an image and a visual experience. Um, so like, I'll just explain a couple elements to give you an idea. So. All these puzzle pieces in the background, they just symbolize that the way that creativity and mental health work together is a complete puzzle. There's pieces missing, you know, maybe we'll never be able to solve it. Um, and then I put this chemistry set in there because obviously brain chemistry, um, just accepting that that's what's going on, it just allows you to do something about it. Um, <clears throat> this like green blob and the pink splotches, I talked about how a lot of people don't seek traditional treatment like medication and stuff because of a lot of different reasons but side effects being one of them. So I drew some vomit and some rash and there's some cloudiness for, you know, that mental fog that comes with it. So, um, and then down on the bottom here I put some music notes and this is actually the first sentence of my paper just to show, you know, painting, music, and writing, it's all the same, so. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I don't really have like a specific platform or intention um, in mind for this kind of perspective that I have, um, but I just know it's something that I'll always continue expanding on, so. Um, <clears throat> I know from personal experience, being in the depths of a mental struggle completely blinds you to what you're capable of. Um, I just know that there's some way for mental health treatment to be way more accessible and effective, um, and I think that's through creativity because everyone is capable of it. Um, I just think there's a way to use that to make treatment benefit absolutely everybody. Um, if anything's taken away from my projects or my presentation, uh, I just hope that it opens a few people's minds to the options that they have, um, the idea that they can create their own recovery, um, to accept that if you don't like the way you feel, you can just change it by getting a little bit creative. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm just now beginning to put these ideas on the power of creativity to paper and canvas, but I always welcome hearing the creative experiences that other people have had, because obviously no two are the same. <clears throat> um, so basically just by viewing absolutely everything from a creative perspective, I've become an eternal optimist um, filled with hope. So since it worked for me, it could work for somebody else. 
Um, and I just thought it would be selfish to keep all of this info to myself, so. <laughs> So, uh, yes, no? Okay, cool. Just fair warning, I'm doing an impersonation of someone fully recovered from the flu right now. So I'm probably going to break a few tenets of public speaking, which is really ironic if you know part of my job, uh, including cleaving close to the manuscript. But, yeah, let's get the PowerPoint going, and I'll be with you in a sec. Why do we stop? We're a go-go society of gadgets and dwindling time. Work, school, friends, more school, more work, more friends, internet, cat videos, store, sleep, maybe, if we're lucky. So again, why do we stop? What makes us care enough to look at something off our beaten path? and unattached to our to-do list? The answer is sad and predictable. Not much. We aren't keen on stopping. We just keep going. We keep walking. We walk down the steps, crunchy with teal salt in the winter, wet with blistered berries in the summer. We walk past the framed bushes, snow mounds, daffodils, and bunnies. Sometimes all at the same time, because hey, Colorado. We walk past smokers and cop cars, and eventually through do front doors that are delayed just a second too long. And when we enter the building, we wipe our feet or don't. We shiver or rejoice in AC. And then we walk right past the Titan, offering him a glance if it's the first time, or nothing if it's not. We carry on to the office, to class, to work, friends, events, life. We don't have time for titans. But one day I did. I had time to truly examine and puzzle at the Goliath staring back at me. And so today, I'm going to share the insights of my walk through the symbolism of the Knowledge Network, the gatekeeper of Red Rocks Community College, and in the process, examine why we stop, why we don't, and why we should. Why don't we notice art? <clears throat> Again, we're busy. Work, class, events. We're distracted. Phones, internet, more cat videos, always with the cat videos. The to-do list, reciting the endless mantra of what needs to be done and what should have been done already. Store, math, feed the fish, laundry, sports practice, essay, and again, maybe sleep. Friends, we're tired. Can you tell I'm kind of hung up on the sleep thing? Uh, our bags are too heavy. Sometimes the art's just not in a good location. It's out of the way. It's in the way. Or you see it so often that you don't really see it at all. And that's the case with the Knowledge Network. I keep saying that, but what is the Knowledge Network? Towering at 26 by 24 feet, the paneled protruding palimpsest is hung right above the front desk in Red Rocks Community College's main entryway, and yet few people actually stop to stare at it, which is kind of impressive when you think about it. 
It's a piece of artwork that's been here for nearly two decades. Created by Lonnie Hazan, whose other work that is notable around Colorado includes the baseball sculptures in front of the Rocky Stadium. And he has tons of pieces from train stops to tucked away little murals and cafes. And there are so many other people that helped him make the Knowledge Network that this placard off to the side is covered in nothing but their names. It's essentially the wall-bound welcome mat of RRCC. But a piece's location in a busy thoroughfare, welcoming or otherwise, isn't the only source of its neglect by those in transit. There's also art apathy. It's not my major. Yeah, it's pretty, but it's just art. It's not relevant to me. I don't get it. And so on. But what are we missing when we just keep walking? How many pieces of art are there in this college? I don't actually know the answer to that, and I don't think anyone does. But there are well over a thousand. Reproductions, originals, framed installations, sculptures, handmade, machine-made. We have a fully functioning work wood shop here. I mean, this school is decorated in art inside and out. But how many did you look at on your way here? Any? In each piece, there's a mass of meaning. But it's hard to find one where that's more true than the knowledge network. So now we're down to the nitty gritty. This colossus is comprised of 65 three-dimensional panels. Each panel is home to seven layers of painting, printing, embossing, engraving, and more to form a palimpsest, which is layers within layers, but essentially means a piece whose layers are intended to be evident. They are distinct, yet merge. And it's, it's like a collage with transparent fragments. Collectively, there are 455 paintings in the Knowledge Network. Together they create, first and foremost, the imposing visage of the Vitruvian Man. But that isn't the only Da Vinci nod within the piece. The installation's creator, the aforementioned local artist, Lonnie Hansen, also added his journal entries and notes to the work, but engraved them backwards, just like Da Vinci's journals. To analyze the Knowledge Network as a whole would take at least an essay, but luckily, Claro has that covered. So for now, I'll just glance over a few of my favorite sections of the work. And I'm gonna confess that they're my favorite because I totally missed them. And a few of them, I'm actually not even sure how long it took me to find them, and others were actually pointed out to me. So the first are his legs. When you look initially, you see this bramble of tentacles and roots, vines curling about. But if you look closer, engraved in the etchings are the Vitruvian legs, all four of them just as much an anatomical study as they ever were. Now, my second favorite part is the hidden face. So this one's a little hard to see, and even outlining it for people before um, they've missed it, so I'm gonna walk up here. We'll start with the eye, because that's the first part that I noticed, and it always stood out to me because it doesn't fit with the rest of the painting, and I was like, what is that? It's a blue gem up here. And then from there, we can find the bridge of the nose. Going down, nostrils, lips. And this bad boy makes up the entire left side of the painting. And he leads us to my next favorite part, which is the brain stem. The whole piece, the face goes up, forms the crown of the head, 
and back and around. And in the center, we have an artistic rendering of the human brainstem. And again, Lonnie actually pointed that one out to me. I promise you I'm not that smart. I totally missed it. Um, but I think it's hard to get more appropriate in a piece designed to symbolize the interconnectivity of learning than to include a symbolic brain. So we've covered the things that we overlook and why we overlook them, particularly at Red Rocks. But why does it matter? Why should we pay attention? Art impacts us all. It changes the way we see the world. Pushing buttons, sorry. <laughs> and what's in it? It records cultural movements. It records opinions, beliefs, people, and history in general. But on a more tangible level, it can even improve health and mood. As one study by Ocean Vartanian, an expert on neuro the neuroscience of aesthetics and creativity, found. In the study, participants' cortisol levels were tested. Cortisol is basically the stress hormone, as anyone who's ever to public speaking knows. It weakens the immune system, it causes depression, obesity, and generally bad days all around. So Vartanian sent one group of participants regularly on their lunch breaks to an art museum. At the end of each visit, they measured cortisol levels. And as predicted at the end of the study, they found a decrease in cortisol. And from a questionnaire, participants reported feeling better overall. And, and for the record, they were from a very high stress office environment where they naturally had higher cortisol levels than the general population. But beyond health, and mood, art also sharpens the mind. When using focused thought, the kind where your conscious brain is fully engaged with a task, to examine a work of art, which you can also just call actively looking at art as opposed to glancing at it, studies have found another interesting result. One particular study from a Smithsonian article entitled, How Does the Brain Process Art? noted that when viewing art, the areas of the brain that uh, correspond with what it would be like to do or experience the things depicted in the artwork fire up. If the central object is a man in motion, the motor cortex starts revving. In short, we vicariously feel the actions and sensory details of artwork. It's basically a mini workout section for the brain and because I'm biased and a writer, I'm just going to plug the fact that detailed writing does the same thing. But outside of ourselves, there's another reason that we should dig into art anytime we can. We talk about what we experience and what we see. We share. If we like a piece, or even if we don't, odds are we're going to tell somebody about it. And so art spreads. What's more, communicating about art expands meaning. Person A sees one thing, person B sees another. When you combine those two interpretations, you get a third. You expand both perspectives and unlock new horizons for the artwork. Art can create a dialogue. Just by looking at a piece, you're establishing a dialogue with it. You're imbibing what you see and altering it with your personal biases and experiences, changing its meaning. It's language without words. It's feelings and symbols, a sense of knowing and questioning at once, which is not just a general byproduct of all art, but the specific goal of the knowledge network. It's not meant to be finite, but interlocking and endlessly multiplying evolution. In the course of writing this speech and the essay that spawned it, I have stared at, stood before, sat in front of, ogled, 
and introduced others to, as well as generally studied the Knowledge Network in person, no less than a dozen times. And I am still staring at the pictures. I don't think I'll ever stop staring. However, if I had to take one thing away at the end, one piece of insight or grand epiphany, it would be this, change. Last night, I received an email from Lonnie Hansen in response to my invitation to the conference. He informed me that they are in the deascensioning process of the Knowledge Network. He himself had only just received a letter from the college notifying him of the remodel. Neither of us are sure if the Knowledge Network will be going back up afterwards. Change is inevitable and constant and cliche, but it's also here. So while I urge you to stop and to remember that we all have a minute, a space between here and there, and that art everywhere needs to have eyes and minds upon it, today in particular, I urge you to go look at the architectural and artistic marvel that has graced Red Rocks' entryway for nearly two decades, guiding and inspiring her students. You don't have to stay long. You don't have to understand anything. You just have to stop, stare, and connect to the network while you still can. Thank you so much. I'd like to give another round of applause to all the presenters. <laughs> We're going to open it up to Q&A now. Is this thing working? It's, okay. Um, and you guys have to make sure you speak. It's a directional mic, so you have to speak really closely to this when you're addressing um, people's questions and comments. And I will just open it up to the floor now. So who would like to start us out with a question or a comment? This is actually for both of you. Um, so obviously within any artistic discipline, whether it's writing or music or visual arts, um, there can be any number of interpretations, both on the part of the author of the piece as well as the people that are viewing it. Um, and so my question for both of you as artists is whether or not you feel that the artist's interpretation of their own piece is as or more valid than the interpretation of those that are viewing it. Um, well, for me, the majority of what I do is for myself. I mean, that's just how I get through it, pretty much everything. So um, I definitely do want the people that are viewing it to relate to it. But yeah, I'm going to just say that it is probably most important to me. Just um, I'm kind of on the flip side because as a writer and an editor, um, I have the unique stance of looking from both the marketing perspective and the creative perspective, so I highly value my opinion and I hate being misinterpreted, <laughs> but I believe kill the author, kill the artist, uh, how it impacts you. I, I like the formalist read, that's how I typically approach pieces. I don't look for what the author intended when I analyze. I just look for what I got and what I found. So I think really both. I'm equivocal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I actually have something that I would like to say. It was really funny, you know, all these pieces um, seem to deal in some way with the power that we have to recreate our own lives through artistic expression. We saw that across all three pieces or either through creative expression on our, on our own or through enjoying and absorbing someone else's creative expression. And I thought of a, of a pun, of a punny while you were <laughs> going because the first person was talk, dealing with royalty and princesses and you said something really great from your mom, which by the way, your mom's my new hero. And she's my hero she's, too. <laughs> yeah, and she here? No. Okay. She's <laughs> when she told you know she you said she gave you free reign and just said don't get 
paint on the carpet, you know? And so it made me I think, did, anyways. Yeah, well, you know, pain happens. We have new um, carpet. But the phrase free reign came to me, ha, 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 like reign, <laughs> queen. But that we all probably need free range, too, which is what your piece brought up to mind, that, that this freedom to have some space in our lives to create and enjoy creation. I don't know if you guys have anything you want to say to that or if that's just me blurting, but um, if you have a response to that random string of thoughts I just threw at you, that would be awesome. No, I mean, I just think that was a great way to sum it up and totally got what I was trying to say, so. Have to agree. I mean, I think that when you put limits on how people can intake media, I think it gets into the realm of censorship, which always makes me very nervous. I think that people are intaking art at all is far more important than how they're doing it, or even necessarily what the art is. You know, if it's something they enjoy, I think that's my bottom line. This is kind of in response to the question about whether you think the interpreter's opinion is more important or the creator's. Um, like you were saying, you create most of your art for yourself. Do you find that when you kind of let go of what other people are going to think and you create it more for yourself, it, it like meets a higher standard for yourself? Yeah, I mean, it definitely does, just because nobody else even needs to know every little thing that I'm doing with it. Um, I don't know, it's such, such a difficult thing to decide, but um, yeah, it is more satisfying um, for me. I don't, I don't really honestly care that much if people understand the full meaning, but um, like in this case, I, I was trying to do something for other people, so like in this case, it would matter more, but Um, I will always write for myself first and foremost. I will always doodle for myself first and foremost and take pictures of pretty clouds for myself first and foremost. And then in the drafting process, I think that's when it come, other people come into my creative process because um, particularly in writing, drafting is very important and getting other eyes on a piece is very important because you may think you're conveying your meaning clearly, but you may not be. And so my meaning will, sometimes you have to kill your darlings and kill your metaphors. There's, there's a lot of metaphorical murder in writing. Um, and so when someone else gives you a read that is completely opposite of what you intended for a piece, then I will go back in and redraft it because my meaning matters more than the pretty words I put down the first time around. Are there questions or comments for the speakers? You can even ask them about their process too. Hi. <laughs> Sorry if this question throws you guys for a loop. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I was I also, like so, you know, really fascinated by this change through creativity that seemed to run through all three talks. And, um, and I'm also looking at three really strong and really cool women. And, um, and I have, I guess, kind of a two-parter. Mm -hmm. One is, how do you think your gender inflects your creativity? And I think the second one, if that seems like it's too big, um, what is your happily ever after? Because I think the two of you guys are... Um, <laughs> really kind of doing some really great and interesting things that kind of respond to the call of action from the first talk. Before you guys begin to answer that, actually I'll stall for time for you for a moment so you can think of some brilliant thing to say. But the first speaker actually wanted me to apologize on her behalf that she had to leave. She had an unavoidable circumstance and that's why she took off and she felt really bad about having to do that. So thanks for bringing her perspective in as a jumping off point for this. And I probably, um, she told me I could speak for her a little bit because I worked with her quite a bit. She was my student in my class when she created that piece. And so I think the way that she might respond, can you, can you phrase the first part of your question again? The, 
how like gender and collective yeah identity. and so for her um she she is very open about this she struggled her entire life with her gender role and with how she was supposed to present as a woman and um she developed eating disorders and deep depression suicidal thoughts and again she's told me i could be open about all this um, if i did respond um, on her behalf and um it has only been in the last couple of years through recreating actively recreating